we've been studying the Spirit of God as He chose to reveal Himself. Because Jesus sent us at the time of His ascension, He promised that He would go to the Father, which He did. He promised that He would ask of the Father to send another comforter, another person, another person that comes alongside, another spirit, if you would, but Jesus said it in English this simple way. I will ask the Father and He will send to you another comforter. And we know that based upon the disciples waiting in the upper room at the time that was appointed, God sent them another comforter. Now, what happened when He sent him that comforter was that the Spirit of God came into, so to speak, prominence or preeminence in the world. He became that force that hinders, that power that keeps other things at bay. He is the spirit of truth that reveals truth. He is our teacher. He is our guide. He is the person who whispers in our ear, who influences our understanding, who causes us to know wisdom, who gives us fruits of the spirit that causes things to happen in our spiritual side that manifest themselves in our physical side, like peace that passes all understanding. We like to call that peace, but really there should be a better word for it because peace, really, we don't have much concept of. But confidence, we do. So there is a peace that is completely confident of an expectation of faith that can resolve itself that no matter what happens in the world, irregardless of fires, floods, tornadoes, catastrophes, or anything else that comes at a person, there's still that peace that passes all understanding, that confidence in the Lord, that trust, that belief in God. And that's what the Holy Spirit does in us. That is a fruit, we call it, of the Spirit. Now, the weird thing is, is that if I sat here and told you that the Holy Spirit is a person, then you'd say, well, great, I'd like to meet him. And then I couldn't introduce you to him, we might have an issue. You see, that's where it gets a little bit conflicting when we talk about the Holy Spirit as being a person. Because I can share with you, share with you the Word of God, and we know that God is the Spirit, and they that worship Him with worship and Spirit and truth. And we know that God is Father, Son, and Spirit because Jesus said so. He said that even the Godhead is revealed in nature. Three aspects of a being that consist of independent operation, but yet still are the same being, meaning that we can be it can be revealed even in creation as we look closer at it. But to be perfectly blunt, and I'm one of the only probably teachers out there, or I don't like to call myself teacher, but person who likes to relate information to you, I'm probably one of the few that will relate to you the reality that I don't get it. If you can't show me, you know, who he is, then how are you calling him a person? You see, that's the problem, is that when we start talking about something that we can't demonstrate, then we get into a room where people like to argue. We get into a place where people like to debate. We get to that religious idea or ideology where people will say, well, because we can't prove it, we're going to invent it. Well, no, we're not. You see, in sharing about the Word of God, we know that God has described the Holy Spirit. God has described the Spirit of God. God has not bothered to explain Himself in any way, shape, or form, ever. Jesus is the only one who has ever said to us things that we could put a handle on and understand with our finite mind. Like when He said, if you have seen Me, you have seen the Father. So the physical manifestation of God Himself, the Father, is Jesus. Now, scientifically, or science fictionally, I can accept that. That makes sense to me. So I accept that any time I want to see a physical reality of God, my Father, I look at Jesus and I see Him. Now, when you talk about the Spirit of God, then it gets a little dicey, because whenever I look at the way people act, and the way people behave, none of them act as though the Spirit of God is a person. They say it, they acknowledge it, they write it in these nice statements of faith. But when you start listening to the way they talk, the 
pouring of the Spirit, the dove like a spirit, the presence of the Spirit, all these weird words that they use that aren't necessarily found in the Bible, then you begin to get the reality of what I mean by I have a problem with what they say what they say they believe and then what they actually do because what they do contradicts what they say they believe now that's why I bring it up because you're gonna find that a lot of people have a problem with the Spirit of God a lot of people don't understand him because it is a person the Spirit of God is not a it it's not a power it's not a force it's not the great cosmic being out there that kind of holds the universe together because we're told Jesus does by the you know Jesus holds all things together by he does <laughs> can't remember the name the scripture exactly but the Spirit of God as I started this study spoke to me and made himself aware that there is aspects of things that we need to be honest and truthful about because he is the spirit of truth we're not meant to lie about the Holy Spirit we're not meant to say that we understand completely about the Holy Spirit we're meant to understand what we do know and share what we can relate on a personal level who he is what he does and how he operates because you see the Spirit of God is here he's in you and he's in me Jesus promised it when it happened as soon as we became born again we were given a portion or a measure of the Spirit so to speak a down payment as it were a deposit on us that when that time came God would call us home to be with him then by drawing us with his spirit then he would draw that spirit in us to be with him we don't know what will happen at the time of the rapture a lot of people say you know there'll be this huge catastrophe and I don't find in scripture they say that there'll be this you know where the carcasses are there the bodies will be and that they'll be immediately transported into heaven you know their body and well we'll see you know it could be very well be possible that this flesh might just drop dead and suddenly you know our spirits go to inhabit a spiritual body now I doubt that because Jesus took his physical body into heaven so it's probable that that's what's true but who knows God can do whatever he wants to do but in the Spirit of God and the way that we've been studying him we have discovered that there are certain things that though he is a person and though I can't introduce you to him he has characteristics abilities capabilities and things that identify him as being likened unto a person now for me personally I can't ever agree with people that will say well you know he's a person just like Jesus is and I'll go you know he's God yes he's the Spirit of God yes like Jesus no I can't do that because the Spirit of God did not manifest himself as a physical being he doesn't come as a dove although the Spirit of God rested upon him as a dove in the likeness of but that doesn't mean the Spirit of God is a dove that would be really a struggle for me because I've had encounters where God has revealed himself to me whether through a hummingbird or some special messenger that he sent or you know, God revealing his word you know or God literally appearing you know like in the burning bush as he did to Moses you know where he was a bush that was on fire that was not consumed do we claim that God is a burning bush? Of course not. Was he the fire? Of course not. But in the physical realm, as limited as we are, we only see certain aspects that are manifestations or appearances as best that can be identified so that we would relate to the Spirit of God. Now when we enter into a different dimension or a different reality when we die, then we may see something different like when John was there in heaven and he saw the seven spirits before the throne of God I don't know what that means <laughs> I'll be honest I have my suspicions we're not told it doesn't explain it it just says the seven spirits are before the Spirit of God and Isaiah does have a reference towards the spirit of wisdom spirit of God spirit of fear of the Lord and all these other things we'll see you know but what we do know we've been reading and studying in this book you know with Living Waters with Chuck Smith because we know that people have gotten carried away you know they get emotionally charged 
and use sometimes more of their emotion than their thought process when they like to talk about spiritual matters. They get all worked up and excited and bound up and confused and abused and they start doing all kinds of weird things, you know, because that's about the time that when someone who's not familiar with things of the spirit suddenly gets all wound up and they're open to any kind of spirit that comes along. Literally, I mean, to be perfectly blunt, I mean, when I, when I see people rolling around on the floor or barking like dogs or laughing like hyenas or throwing gold dust in the air, I know there's something wrong with them. And if that's the spirit of God, it's not my spirit that, you know, I want to be participating in with them. I choose to acknowledge the spirit of God as a person and to direct my attention to him. As he said, he would point to and reveal Jesus. Anything that points to and reveals Jesus, I'm willing to accept. But until I see in that manifestation where people are doing those weird things, Jesus revealed and Jesus exalted, I'm not interested. And I think you may find that in Scripture we're told that. That when He comes, the Spirit of Truth, He shall lead you into all truth. That He would not speak of Himself, but He would speak of me, is what Jesus said. So I expect that when we finally know who the Spirit is as a person, we'll discover that He's meek, He's gentle, He's tender, and He's so humble or so huge and great that of course our finite minds couldn't handle it or that it was so overwhelming of love that He has to limit Himself so much so because we can't really deal on a one-to-one -one basis with the person that the Holy Spirit is. And such so, that's why we are studying completely in every aspect that we can the Holy Spirit. Because we really want to know what we do know and what we don't know and what is distorted and what's contorted and what's the reality. And as I began this series, I didn't expect really the Spirit of God to come to me. You know, I, I, <laughs> I know. I didn't expect that when I looked at this as a devotional, I didn't expect that God would want to reveal himself to me and to spend in a quality way that time of that tenderness, that sublime gentility that would manifest himself to me. And when you begin to comprehend this, maybe you'll grasp things that you've heard other teachers say and it'll begin to put the pieces together for you. We hear people like Chuck Missler or theologians or people that are into the theoretical sciences like quantum physics talk about time dimensions and the reality of eternal now and eternality, trying to describe what eternal life could be like when you exist in a presence or a continuity where there is no time. In other words, in our physical realm, in other words, the life we're living right now as we stand here today looking at each other with this flesh that's deteriorating, if we only lived according to that, then of course for us eternity would be a very finite existence. You would have birth and you would have death and that would be the end of it, wouldn't it? But if that's all you believe in and that's all you know, how sad your life will be to discover that that's not the end of life. There is more to Eternal, eternal life than the reality of just the physical plane. And now that we've proven that in mathematics, that there is dimensionality in life and living in this dimension that we live in, that something exists beyond us, then we likewise know because the Bible had already told us spiritually that those things exist. I'm glad that mathematical sciences can project into quantum physics and quantum realities those theoretical ideas, but for me, I can accept someone who's come from stepping out of eternity into my finality, meaning my finite existence, and spoke to me and told me that there is such a thing as eternal life. And that person was Jesus. Jesus came as God, the Son of God, and limited himself to be the Son of Man, that he might explain to us etern eternality or eternal life, this existence that this isn't all there is. This is, in a matter of fact, like a blink of an eye when it comes to eternal or ages to ages life that will go on once we have passed from our physical existence to another 
reality or dimension. And so when Jesus did that, he spoke to the leaders, the religious leaders of his time, and he says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, obviously, and it begins and it dies and it stays because from dust you started and from dust you shall return. But is that all that there is, dust? He told the religious leaders of his time, no, because that which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the spirit is spirit. You must be born again, for without being born again, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. And the religious leader, who happened to be Nicodemus at the time, was surprised and asked, you know, kind of on the sly, you know, a little, shall a man enter his own room, you know? In other words, he understood what he could see and he understood what he could touch, but he didn't understand what he had been told because God was seeking to reveal it in a way that he didn't comprehend. And that's sometimes what happens to us when we get into things of the Spirit and why people like Pentecostals or other people get carried away and sometimes get a little too far gone down the road, you know, when they're getting so much so into one aspect of what God is doing. God never intended for people to be rolling around on the floor, barking like dogs, acting like miraculous workers of miracles, or, you know, standing up and declaring weird things that were going to happen. Jesus was very natural and normal, so much so that the sinners, the harlots, the prostitutes, the child molesters, any person, a tax collector, could come up to him and talk to him. So simple and so gentle because the Spirit of God was without measure in Jesus. Now, what that means, ooh, boy, you know, it just means that wherever he went, he influenced everyone around him because of the unseen things that were happening by way of the Spirit of God. He was the fullness of the Spirit of God manifested in the flesh. What that means, I don't really fully know. But I know that as we learn, we'll begin to comprehend and see and understand it in better ways than what we do today. The slow pace as we begin to steady ourselves away from these quick answers, these instant solutions, these obnoxious emotions that cause us to jump to conclusions without thinking through or fully experiencing the love the joy and the peace that God intended for us, when we finally come to slowing down to comprehend that, then I think you'll see the Holy Spirit begin to teach you. I think you'll find that the Spirit of God will come to you in a very profound, tender way, a gentleness you've never understood before, a peacefulness you've never comprehended, a way of God manifesting Himself that Maybe all our lives was spent in such a hurry, we miss and missed the time that God was there all along. And all we needed to do was to slow down, to maybe take a second, third, and fourth look at what we take for granted, and then see that there's something a little more than what we quickly made a rash and instant judgment on. In the book, we've been examining the personality of the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of God, and we've come to the place where we're discussing emotion. The Spirit has emotion. Paul warned the Ephesians, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, Ephesians 4.30. Likewise, in the Old Testament, Isaiah wrote, but they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he was turned to be their enemy. Isaiah 63.10 Those two things, when I think about them, amaze me at how stupid I really am. I take for granted my grace often. I completely take for granted being forgiven and future forgiveness because I do sin and I do make mistakes. I go way out of my way, you know, to always thank God for what he's done for me and thank Jesus for the sacrifice that he's done to take my place for the sinfulness and sinful nature that I am. But you know one thing that I've never really grasped completely was how much I grieve the Holy Spirit. And I think that when I look at the age we live in, this age of violence, this age of either pornography or sensuality or 
distractions, if you really want to call it, basically boils down to lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, pride of life, and very prideful, are we not? That I'm amazed at how much I am sure I grieve the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. How much I vex Him with my attitudes at times, my actions that aren't really in keeping with what I just learned from Him. I mean, as I've learned from God, I've discovered that God has a plan for me and He has a purpose, but I must yield my life and my self-will and my selfishness to Him and cause myself at times to turn away from doing my own thing to seek out what His choices are in a matter. To really stop what I'm doing to say, whoa, back up. I don't need to make a snap decision. I'm not qualified to make that instantaneous call. I need to know what the ramifications are if I make these decisions before I make them. I need to check in with God and let Him decide for me. Because if I make the wrong choice, would I not be vexing? Would I not be grieving? Would I not be challenging the authority of the Holy Spirit as He is sent to comfort and to lead me into all righteousness. You see, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 told us that we are to trust in the Lord with all our heart, to lean not into our own understanding. In all our ways we are to acknowledge Him. He would direct our path. We act as though we have the understanding and we can direct our own path and that is opposite of what the Spirit of God and what the Word of God says. The Spirit of Truth has come to reveal to us the truth. The facts are you are not meant to be in charge. When you are, you're failing. When you seek to be led, guided, and inspired by God's Spirit, then he receives the glory and he takes the responsibility for the actions that you do. But if you've done them of your own accord without seeking the Spirit of God or as we like to say walking in the Spirit of knowledge and wisdom, walking in His Word, then guess what? You reap what you sow because the Spirit of God will make sure you do. Because He is working on you to work in you to accomplish God's will for you. You can vex the Holy Spirit. Now this would be impossible to say of a mere essence or a non-person or an entity. It would be ridiculous to say, please don't grieve that plant or you have vexed that plant, he's angry with you. You cannot say this of anything other than a person. The Holy Spirit is a person who loves you and yet who can be grieved and who can be vexed by you. I can't express enough how much more so this year, after 35 years of knowing you know, who the Holy Spirit is and all these things of the Spirit of God, I can't impress upon you how much more so today God has spoken to me and revealed to me how tender really the Spirit of God is, how gentle and how much so He is vexed and grieved. It just, I'm dumbfounded in awe. It, it makes me fearful in not a negative way, but in a, in a humbling way to realize that the Spirit of God really is the tenderness of God in a lot of ways manifested in how he deals with us and how he is open to being vexed by and grieved by our attitudes and actions. On the positive side, the book of Romans, Paul speaks about the love of the Spirit, Romans 15.30. Now I wonder, have you ever heard a sermon a teaching, a Bible study, ever preached, taught, or explained on how the love of the Holy Spirit, on the love of the Holy Spirit, on how He loves you, 
I'm sure you've heard of sermons on the love of Christ. I'm sure you've heard sermons about the love of God or the love of Jesus. But have you heard a sermon about the love of the Holy Spirit? Paul often talked about the love of Christ, and surely we've all heard many sermons on the love of God. But interesting enough, the love of the Holy Spirit is seldom broached in sermons, yet it is a biblical fact. The question is, why was it ignored? Again, only a person can love, and the Holy Spirit loves. You may adore a certain plant or flower in your home, but it would be nonsense to say, my, how that plant loves you. It's just passionate about you. But it would make perfect sense to say, the Holy Spirit loves you. In fact, he's passionate about you. Better yet, it's not only true, it's a fact. Father, I thank you that you've given us your love manifested in a way we've never imagined before. Your love demonstrated physically by Jesus dying on the cross for us. And that physical reality is something that we can see, we can touch, and it causes us to feel. But God, we've never really had a complete comprehension of the love of the Holy Spirit, how he loves us except by those things that we experience in his gifts and in his fruit. But the reality of who he is, God, has escaped us because we've been in such a hurry to move on, move forward, to go without and to do without him and without you. For God, often in such a gentle and meek way, we have forgotten to take the time to pray and to sit still and wait upon you as you have chosen to reveal yourself by his spirit. God, I thank you that you've given me these tokens of love of the Holy Spirit, the hummingbird that visits me every time that I need a word from you, or the, the beauty of the garden that you've expressed to me, or the wind as it blows when that gust comes up and seems to just inspire the right moment. God, I thank you that tokens of who he is have been manifested to me at the right time and the right place. And God, I pray that for other people, it wouldn't be a token only, but rather the revelation of Jesus as the Spirit reveals him to us, that they would see and know that they are loved by him. God, as Spirit of God, we don't know you and we don't fully comprehend you. I know we grieve you, and I know we hurt you, and I know we vex you. Have mercy upon us, Spirit of God, for we choose not to give in to that failure, but we ask that you would enable us to humbly submit ourselves to you, that we would walk no longer after the flesh, but rather in your spirit, after the things of the Spirit of God in the spiritual realm. That we would no longer be as children that don't know when they offend their parents, but rather we would begin to recognize and humble ourselves to you as you reveal to us who you are. Spirit of God, God, even the revelator of Jesus himself and the fullness of the Father in Jesus. For that we thank you, Spirit, that you would be with us and in us and allow us to come to you and to acknowledge you as we acknowledge the Father and the Son and the Spirit as God. Thank you.